Thank you so much for inviting me to this conference. Although I'm not a pediatrician, I am a uh, I am a medicine uh, internist. Yeah, thank you so much for calling me. This is a vast topic. I would like to do justice to it as much as possible. Uh, it has a very special place in my heart as it was my thesis topic also. Uh, so, as we know, this is one of the smallest and the simplest bacteria. It was uh, diagnosed during the World War II, known as the Eaton agent uh, by its uh, nemesis. And it is uh, found to have a lot of atypical pneumonia-like picture in the outbreaks amongst the war uh, refugees in the World War II. Uh, currently, it has been found to have recurring episodes and epidemics every few years. Uh, amongst the 120 species of mycoplasma, hardly a few are known to cause uh, human diseases. And it favors localization in our respiratory epithelium, urogenital tracts, as well as elementary canal and joints. It is spread via human co uh, to human contact, sexu sexual contact, and via urogenital uh, and droplet infections. So if we talk about mycoplasma pneumonia per se, it can invade and it can cause hematogenous spread and transplant central infection and causing devastating neonatal infections as well. So let us start with a case. Uh, my apologies, it's an adult and not a pediatric uh, case, but uh, this is a recent case that I encountered in our uh, hospital. So it's, he's a 45-year-old uh, male. He's an uncontrolled diabetic, hypertensive, obese, dyslipidemic, and he presents to the emergency with history of fever since the last 12 days. So he uh, specifically says this, that the fever was very high grade. It, it, uh, he had chills, but he's afebrile since the last two days. He had cough, which was initially dry and non-productive. However, since the last five days, the cough has become productive and with copious amount of sputum and he has occasional blood-stained sputum as well. Since the last three days, he is short of breath. So he was admitted in an outside hospital and he was found to have uncontrolled sugars for which insulin was started. He had an episode of respiratory distress with a lot of chest discomfort and documented desaturation up to 65%. Here, he also had an episode of black tarry stool. The uh, primary healthcare center over there referred the uh, patient to Gangaram Hospital and uh, he presented to us with labs from the outside hospital showing a drop in hemoglobin, showing elevated TLC counts and some thrombocytosis. Uh, he was also found to have grade 1 fatty liver and a bilirubin of 5.7. My apologies, this is indirect hyperbilirubinemia. His creatinine was normal at this point. Now, when he came to us, he was he was pale, he was ictric, and the rest of his systemic examination was virtually, uh, general physical examination was virtually normal. His uh, oxygen requirement was 4 to 5 liters, and he was very tachypnic and tachycardic. Respiratory examination, he had diffuse V's. He has fine crepts. However, rest of the systemic examination was fine. So, the labs that we did at our emergency showed that the hemoglobin further dropped from 10 to 6.7. His platelets were continued to rise and his TLC count was 25,000. His uh, MCV, MCH, MCHC, they were all deranged. We sent a sputum uh, sample for this patient. However, it just grew mixed flora and no pathogenic organism. Gene expert was negative. His CRP was highly elevated. Procal was negative and ESR was elevated. Here, a peripheral smear showed some anisocytosis, normocytic hypochromic cells, some polychromatophils, and an occasional spherocyte. His uh, anemia profile had an elevated ferritin. However, uh, as the patient was not very sick, we did not think in the tunes of HLH. He had elevated reticular site, and his direct uh, uh, Coombs test was positive. This was 3 plus significantly positive. We followed uh, him up with monospecific comb test, which showed uh, C3D positive. Here we look at the chest x-ray of this patient. And essentially, we do not see any consolidation. However, there are fine reticular nodular opacities that can be demonstrated. We uh, performed a respiratory biofire in which we detected mycoplasma pneumonia. So here we are looking at a case who had mycoplasma pneumonia to begin with and probably has led into autoimmune hemolytic anemia as a complication of mycoplasma. So uh, reviewing mycoplasma, we have approximately a lack of hospitalizations in adults in US. However, in children, the trend has been rising. So if we look at the incidence under 16 years of age, it's almost 
and between the age group of 5 to 14 years where they have a lot of school outbreaks the incidence of mycoplasma pneumonia is high has as high as 14 percent contributing to almost 10 to 40 percent of community acquired pneumonias in close populations and outbreaks and epidemics it can contribute to almost 70 percent of community acquired pneumonias it can cause self-limiting to life-threatening diseases in uh, kids less than five years usually it causes wheeze and coryza and a frank LRTI is relatively uncommon. However, between 5 to 15, uh, bronchopneumonias are very common and they often require hospitalization. Uh, in severe cases, they can present with bronchiolitis, plur uh, pleural effusions, lung abscesses and even pulmonary embolism. And of, uh, as often as more than 50%, they have superadded bacterial infections. It is very interesting to note that uh, there is a relation with COPD and asthma with mycoplasma. So the lung microbiota seen tested in amongst the COPD patients, they had a lot of mycoplasma pneumonia. Mycoplasma is also responsible for acute episodes as well as recurrent episodes and acute exacerbations of both COPD as well as asthma. Uh, if we look into the pathogenesis, so there are direct mechanisms and there are immune mediated mechanisms, both of which are acting and contributing to uh, life threatening disorders. So amongst direct mechanisms, we have uh, invasive properties, we have toxin damages. Among the immune mechanisms, we have humoral as well as cell mediated immunity, both getting knocked off. The patient will can present with thrombosis, vasculitis and severe cytokine storms. So uh, it has a special membrane uh, interactions with our respiratory epithelium and treat, uh, TLR2 mediated cytokine storms purpose, uh, are very common. Almost 25% of the patients experience extra pulmonary complications. So this is something that is very alarming and this is something that we must look in deeply. Extra pulmonary manifestations are usually immune mediated and are antibodies which uh, get developed against the glycoprotein antigens of the mycoplasma. They cross react with either RBCs causing hemolytic anemias and various hem hematological disorders or with uh, uh, brain cells causing a lot of CNS complications. So, uh, RBC membrane antigen I is the one which uh, cross reacts with uh, mycoplasma uh, pneumonia causing autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Some a few words about autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So, other manifestations are also uh, thrombocytopenia and DIC which can cause catastrophic events in a patient and these are triggered by lower temperatures hence they are called cold agglutinins and uh, so co lower temperatures in the extremities for for example in developing shock they precipitate complement mediated hemolysis so cold agglutinin antibodies they've been ob observed in barely 50 to 60 percent of the patients what does that mean that means many are missed but also it has been documented that this causes subclinical hemolysis in even uh, mildly symptomatic patients and they have been found to have elevated reticulocytes. So, uh, early pickup of uh, subclinical hemolysis can take us far away from a devastating complication. So, what is the treatment? We have to keep the patient warm and the blood transfusions have to be typically done in a blood warmer. Steroid therapy has not been uh, very variedly treated for cold agglutinin hemolytic anemia. However, it's been advocated for warm agglutinin hemolytic anemia. In cold hemolytic anemias, it has been tried. However, there are no RCTs or guidelines as to what is the dose and for how long do we have to monitor. What are the CNS manifestations? However, they are uh, as frequent as 25%, they can be very life-threatening, ranging from aseptic meningitis to encephalitis to meningoencephalitis, they can be varied complications. They are usually between the time period of 2 to 14 days from the onset of respiratory complications. However, they can be even before or much after the uh, actual respiratory uh, complications. It has been postulated that direct invasion of the uh, bacteria and immune mediated both the hypotheses are contributing to this illness uh, there are dermatological manifestations as well as non-specific gi manifestations that these patients can have so if we look at the radiological features we all know that this is atypical pneumonia so what does atypical pneumonia compromise it basically means that there is interstitial inflammation which is not typically demonstrated as a consolidation so our chest x-ray will have interstitial infiltrates, it can have alveolar infiltrates and some amount of pleural effusion. Whereas CT findings are most frequently found to be as bronchial wall thickenings. 
centrilobial nodules and as we know as ground glass opacities. So these ground glass opacities should prompt us to diagnose atypical pneumonias and think in tunes of mycoplasma, EBV, CMV, Legionella, Chlamydia. This should direct our empirical therapy. However, we must think before giving a broad spectrum antibiotic cover if the patient is not very symptomatic. Now I take us to this case two. So this is the patient uh, that I saw in my first year of residency. He was a 21 year old, very shy male. He had some anorectal malformation and he had a solitary kidney. So he presented to the emergency with fever for a few days, hematuria and decreased urine output. He also had left side testicular pain, which he was very shy to uh, uh, show to me. And he had per urethral discharge since the last two weeks. He was admitted in the in multiple hospitals in the last two weeks and he was treated with all kinds of antibiotics thinking that it's UTI. In emergency department at Ames, he was also given multiple doses of ceftriaxone and piprocil and tazobactam. On examination after admission, he was pale and he had right flank tenderness. He had anemia, his counts were normal, he had thrombocy severe thrombocytopenia and he had azotemia and his creatinine was 6. So here, on evaluation, he was found to have a full field WBCs. He clearly had pyuria. He had RBCs. He had protein. However, his culture repeatedly was sterile. This patient grew mycoplasma hominis. Here, what I'm trying to emphasize is that sterile pyuria can be uh, a cause for not just tuberculosis, but in our country, we must also look at mycoplasma, genital mycoplasmas as well as chlamydia. These organisms are often undetected and these can often be misinterpreted and confused with the normal bacterial UTIs and the patients are given truckloads of antibiotics which lead to further uh, difficult in culture growth. This patient had uh, hydroeuronephrosis, he had uh, police catheter in situ and he had chronic cystitis. So what are the genital mycoplasmas and why are they so common? So, in a general population, we are not even talking about patients with STDs. They are as common as almost 4% in developing countries. Uriplasma, mycoplasma and uh, mycoplasma genitalium and hominis, they are spread by a sexual route, but they also have a lot of further complications. For example, uriplasma can cause urethral and gynecological infections. There was a meta-analysis that was recently done which found that uh, genitalium and hominis along with uriplasma urolyticum are very significant causes of infertility amongst the men. They can invade preg uh, the vagina of pregnant women and translocate to uh, the fetus and cause severe complications such as neonatal sepsis and meningitis. Hence, undetected mycoplasmas, genital mycoplasmas can cause very catastrophic events in our unborn fetuses as well. Mycoplasma genitalium is very notorious, very resistant to antibiotics and very difficult to treat and to be controlled. It is often found amongst the uh, MSM population, hence uh, it is difficult to take history. So the case that I was referring to was very shy to me in front of me, but then I sent a male uh, colleague of mine and he took history and he was an MSM. That is where that he was getting repeated infections and he was shy to declare it to his family. So patients can be asymptomatic and hardly 10% are symptomatic. That's when we miss the diagnosis. Mm. And amongst the long-term complications amongst female, it can lead to PIDs, spontaneous abortions, preterm deliveries and infertility and whatnot. Amongst men, it can cause urethritis. Almost 40% of non-gonococcal urethritis and recurrent urethritis are contributed to mycoplasmas. As I mentioned, sterile pyuria as we evaluate yes, in our... Uh, five minutes left. Yeah, I'm almost done. If you look at sterile pyuria, it is one of the undetected entity and uh, genital mycoplasmas must also be looked up. So it is a diagnostic challenge. We know it's difficult to culture. Culture methods are hardly available in most of the labs. It has good specificity but hardly any sensitivity and it is almost redundant. If you look at PCRs, they have high specificity, they're expensive, but these days we have a lot of multiplex PCRs, like I mentioned, one of the respiratory panels or the genital panels that we are having, which have very good pickup rates, but they are sparsely available in public health centers. So what the most common used methods are the uh, ELISAs, the serological methods, but a uh, downside of it is that we require seroconversions and a fold-fold increase to actually demonstrate uh, mycoplasma. These are very non-specific and they have uh, a downside in form of that these either they are in the form of IgM and IgG combined tests or they are rapid kits of IgM. 
so we need to be very careful before interpreting igm kits can actually uh, give us false positives so they can detect the uh, they can basically detect a previous infection as the igm antibodies can last several months talking a few words about cold agglutinins so they appear within the first week or by the end of the second week and they disappear after 2 3 months they have very good uh, pick up rate but they have false positives with ebv cmv klebsiella pneumoniae and various other autoimmune disorders the multiple rapid diagnostic tests that are available in the form of lamp and in the form of immunochromatographic assays these lateral flow assays have become recently very popular they have very high specificity but low sensitivity so as clinicians we must be aware of the false negative results that can often be there so how do we manage do we need to manage all mycoplasma pneumonia infections no as they are very low mortality and they have often self limiting however we can get confounded as super added secondary bacterial infections are very common so amongst uh, the available options we have fluoroquinolones and macrolides fluoroquinolones uh, are the ones which can be which are actually bactericidal whereas macrolides and tetracycline are bacteriostatic but if we look at the children population macrolides are even regarded as safe in uh, regardless of their age group because of the potential side effects of tetracycline and fluoroquinolones in the younger age group it is important for us to understand this upgrowing resistance to macrolides uh, abuse in amongst the mycoplasmas so there are multiple outbreaks that keep happening patients have prolonged carriage as well as uh, the primary infection does not mount to immunity there was a recent global uh, surveillance data that i think ma'am was mentioning that it was published recently in lancet that actually found out that because of uh, uh, precautions that were taken in during the pandemic and because of the masking there was a drop in the mycoplasma rates however there was a reemergence despite uh, of discontinuation of the respiratory precautions after a very long time this is a very uh, difficult and a very epidemiologically challenging condition in which the rates fall down and again a disease has reemerging so we are also noticing a lot of macrolide resistance uh, the population that was studied for macrolide resistance has been growing over the years from a proportion of 18% to almost 76% in 2019 and this is all because of abuse to macrolides for any simple urti everybody pops in a azithromycin so uh, if i follow up the cases the first case who was a male with autoimmune hemolytic anemia he was transfused with three prbcs uh, through a warmer he was given pulse dose of steroids for 3 days followed by a tapering Two minutes. dose followed by a tapering dose he was given azithromycin along with uh, piperacillin tazobactam and alacin because he had uh, super added bacterial infections and within one week of hospital stay the patient was discharged and following up in the opd the case to the 21 year old male with mycoplasma hominis he was treated just with doxycycline and he was uh, he had resolution in his pyuria he had resolution in his uh, lower urinary tract symptoms he was not given any further antibiotics so my take home point is that mycoplasma pneumonia produces a wide variety of spectrum of diseases and extra pulmonary manifestation is something that we must all look out for these are very common almost as high as 25% of the patients can have them and we must treat early in such cases genital mycoplasmas are very difficult to identify and they often undetected leading to a lot of complications in the future we must all uh, actively look out for such symptoms and uh, identify them early resistance is a very growing concern hence if a patient who uh, is not responding to macrolides resistance testing must be sent out for all alternative uh, therapies must be initiated immediately vaccines are under development however they are very very far from satisfaction and there is not much efficacy in the vaccines so clinical and uh, radiological detection remains a cornerstone for our clinicians thank you so much